now the equally sharp entertainment of Victoria Wood, sold out. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Victoria Wood. Hello. Now, before we go any further, I think I should just tell you that I've applied to become a nun. And they've accepted me, and they're sending somebody to collect me in 10 minutes in an Austin Montego. I just have to take a change of underwear, some tea bags, and a billiard table. Now, I'm joking, they turned me down. They said they didn't want anything more to do with show business people after all the trouble they'd had with Mary O'Hara. Anyway, welcome to the lovely Mayflower Theatre, all the glamour and glitter of show business encapsulated in one venue. But not this one, unfortunately. <laughs> What do we think of when we stand on this stage? Gil Good Romeo, Olivier's Hamlet, Rod Hull's Emu. <laughs> I mean, I like this city, actually. It's sort of an interesting mixture of styles, isn't it? Because it's sort of quite grand on the one hand, but there's a sort of hint of British Home Store's lighting department about it, which I like. <laughs> it's really a bit like an old cinema, isn't it? I sort of keep expecting a man to pop up on an enormous organ. <laughs> that would be a novelty. Um, oh, hello. They're very nice, those boxes, aren't they, with the curtains? That little mobile home stuck on the sides so. there. <laughs> if the milkman comes calling, can you send me like two pints of skimmed and a bilberry yoghurt? Thank you so much. <laughs> what have we got people right at the top? Oh, yes, a lot of mis... Oh, you're waving, hello. You must splash out for a better seat next time. <laughs> <laughs> They're all sitting there looking at the top of my head. They're going, I see your highlights need doing. <laughs> I've just washed it, actually, with my new shampoo, Vidal Sassoon's Wash and Go. <laughs> I like to just get in the shower, wash my hair and go. I like to get dressed first, first in myself. <laughs> oh, now watch the seats, because they have a vicious tip-up here. They told me this terrible story of a woman who was trapped by the car coat and forced to sit through two performances of the Jim Davidson family laughter show. So just... <laughs> I see you're lucky tonight, it's all been hoovered. Normally this is filthy. I came out last night, I thought I was getting a standing ovation, and it was people stood up going, well, I'm not sitting on that. <laughs> But they don't care here, you see. They're so busy with their computerised box office, they don't care about anything else. That accounts for the odd mishap with the tickets. Mr. and Mrs. Smedley, you don't have to go and see the Care Bears. That was a mistake. <laughs> I, they're not too bad here, because when I got in, I thought it looked a bit gloomy. They said to me, would a potted palm help? I said, well, if we lit it and passed it round the audience, really. <laughs> now, I have to tell you, I must tell you, it's only by a miracle I'm actually here at all this week. I've, there's been such a mix-up about me coming here. I only found out about it last week. Well, they said they wrote to me about it in October, but they put a second-class stamp on the letter. So I've not had it yet. And the post is hopeless, isn't it? I don't know why we have two classes of mail. I think first-class mail, they put it all into sacks and say, now, we must sort that out in a minute. And second-class mail, they just put it into sacks. Yeah. I mean, I had a letter last week from John Noakes saying that my new design for the threatening stamp had come third. <laughs> find out about coming here. I wasn't sure, you know, about it, because they, they weren't very complimentary. They said to me, well, we're glad you're coming, but we really wanted somebody a bit more glamorous, you know, a bit more of a Joan Collins type. I said, oh, come on, Joan Collins is not going to come to Southampton of a Thursday night, is she? <laughs> and there's millions of other things she could be doing. There's a pensioner's whist drive in Newbury, happens to it. <laughs> and then there was some talk of Kylie Minogue coming, but she's had an accident. She was doing her hair and she knocked some things off the dressing table as pinned to the ground by a Kirby grip. <laughs> But today's been a very nice day, actually. I got up really, really early this morning. I thought, well, I must have a big hearty breakfast, you know, set me up for tonight. So I had a huge bowl of muesli. God, it's hard work taking muesli, isn't it? It's like having two jobs. <laughs> Apparently, in London, you can phone up and somebody comes around and chews it for you. <laughs> but we don't have these facilities where I live in the north. I mean, in London, you can phone up for anything, can't you? Pizzas, wine glasses. Where I live, we have trouble with interflora. <laughs> Flowers, what do you want them for? <laughs> have you no window box? <laughs> 
No, it's very depressing living in the north, actually. I was quite glad to get away for a bit, because where I live, nobody's got any money at all. You know, there's no posh restaurants or anything like that. If people want a night out, they have to go to Kentucky Flag Chicken. And if they're celebrating, they sit in the window. <laughs> They keep saying they're going to do us up because we're such a depressed area, but all they ever do is put big notices on everything. Like where I live, there's a rubbish dump, and it was just called a rubbish dump, then it was called a tip, then it was called a municipal domestic refuse disposal site, <laughs> and now it's called a heritage centre. <laughs> anyway, so I got up and I had my breakfast, and I thought, well, I'll do my exercises, because I do aerobics to a video every morning. And I was in a bit of a daze this morning, and I was just sort of copying whatever they were doing on the television. And it was only when I found myself embezzling the Christmas club money. I realised I was actually watching an old tape of EastEnders. <laughs> I must say, normally, normally, I'm more of a Coronation Street person myself. I don't know if you watch it. Oh, it's very good. It gets a bit far-fetched at times. I could never really believe Ken Barlow was doing it with Wendy Crozier. <laughs> I mean, what was he doing it with? I could never sort of picture. It doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> no, it's Deirdre I feel sorry for. Deirdre Barlow, what a sad life she's had. She's been married twice. She's had three different traces. One went upstairs and a huff didn't come down for four years. <laughs> and I don't know if you've noticed, the more stressed and unhappy Deirdre becomes, the shorter her perm gets. <laughs> She'll be on the phone next week. Come on, Ken, it's up to my glasses. <laughs> anyway, so I got dressed and I got ready to come out and I realised my jacket needed cleaning, so I had to whip it round to the while you wait cleaners round the corner. They're not terribly good, it's two old bags. One of them keeps you talking, the other one scrapes the worst of it off with her fingernail. <laughs> and it actually had pot noodle all the way down one sleeve, and I was so embarrassed, you know, I didn't like to admit that I ate pot noodle. So I lied, I said it was snot. I thought that was probably... <laughs> <I'm>... <laughs> and then I got in a panic, so I thought my fringe was too long and I should have it trimmed. Well, I normally go to Vidal Sassoon's in Macclesfield, but there wasn't time, so... <laughs> I went to this new place that's opened up over the butchers. It's two boys on a government training scheme. <laughs> now, the government have brought out this new thing. You can either start your own business for three pounds a week, or you can go to Borstal. You know, it's up to you what you do. <laughs> anyway, I think they've done it quite well. It smells of giblets a bit, but... Um... <laughs> then I got in my car to go and collect my roadie, Susan, and the car wouldn't start. So I thought, well, I'm going to phone the RAC, you know, because I paid to join, I paid for home start, I paid for relay, I paid for super relay. It's cost me a fortune. So I phoned up and I said, my car won't start. And they said, has it got any petrol in it? I said, well, of course it's got petrol in it, don't patronise me. And they said, oh, it's an extra £15 a year if you don't want us to patronise you. <laughs> well, I banged the phone down. Anyway, I put some petrol in it, and it started. <laughs> <laughs> then I went to go and collect my roadie, Susan, and Susan is massive. She's sort of like desperate Dan, and you're not quite so effeminate. <laughs> and she was standing, waiting for me on the pavement in these bright red lycra cycling shorts. <laughs> but from the back, it looked like two halves of Edam. <laughs> I mean, they were so tight, she must have lost all feeling from the waist down. She could have had a racing saddle and a map in there somewhere and not noticed. Because <laughs> it was a terrible tight fit in the car with her. Every time she crossed her legs, we went into fifth gear. I said, oh. <laughs> now, she's a very good roadie, but I have to drive her because she can't really see to drive because she's got these terrible contact lenses she got at Argos. <laughs> I said, you should do what I do, splash out, spend another 99 pence, get them from a petrol station. <laughs> Actually, it must get on, you know, because our hotel shuts at half past ten. They said they're not doing a hot meal, but they might leave something under a cloth on the landing. <laughs> we were supposed to be staying round the corner at the big one, but it's full. There's a conference on Jehovah's Witnesses. 450 of the top people from the Jehovah's Witnesses are there. Yes, they're all in the doorway, just at the moment. <laughs> um, so we're staying out on the A33, the Carmina Barana. Bed, breakfast and jet wash we're at. <laughs> It's not too bad. I got there and I complained. I said, I'm sorry, my bed is too small and too hard and too hot. And they came up and said, well, actually, that's the trouser press. <laughs> it's one of those hotels where they give you a kettle in the room, you know, so you can make your own tea. One tea bag they gave me. So I went and said, could I have another tea bag? And she said, no, it's just one tea bag per person. So I had to go out and come back as my own twin to get another tea bag out of it. <laughs> and then they came around with these long strips of paper, you know, with a menu on, saying, if you want continental breakfast in your room, hang this on your knob, she said to me. <laughs> Well, the man in the next door room was very upset about this. <laughs> well, it wouldn't stay on there, you see. <laughs> Be eight o'clock at night on a Saturday, Tracy Clegg and Nicola Battersby coming to town double quick. 
Lovely rendezvous in front of a pillar. Tracy's tall like Jonathan Miller. Nicola's more like Guy the Gorilla if Guy the Gorilla were thick. <laughs> Their hair's been done, it's very expensive. Their use of mousse and jelly is extensive as weapons. Their heads would be classed as offensive and put under some kind of ban. <laughs> They're covered in perfumes, but these are misnomers. Nicholas scent could send dogs into comas. Tracy's kills insects and dustbin aromas and also gets stains off the pan. <laughs> but it's their night out. It's what it's all about. It's looking for lads, looking for fun. A burger and chips, we a sesame bun. They're in the mood. But a fabulous interlude of living it up, painting the town, drinking Bacardi and keeping it down. And it's all all right. It's what they do of a Saturday night. Oh dear, what can the matter be? What can that terrible crunching and clatter be? It's the cowboy boots of Nicola Battersby leading the way into town. They hit the pub and Tracy's demeanor reminds you of a loopy hyena. They have 16 gins and a rum and ribena and this is before they've sat down. <laughs> they dare a bloke from Surrey called Murray to phone the police and order a curry. He gets locked up, it's a bit of a worry, but they won't have to see him again. They're dressed to kill and looking fantastic. Tracy's gone for rubber and plastic. Nicholas dresses a piece of elastic. It's under a heck of a strain. <laughs> but it's their night out. It's what it's all about. It's ordering drinks, ordering cabs, making rude gestures with Donna kebabs. They're in the mood. But a fabulous interlude of weeing in parks, treading on plants, getting their dresses caught up in their pants, and it's all. <laughs> It's what they do of a Saturday night. Oh dear, what can the matter be? What can that horrible slurping and splatter be? It's Tracy Clegg and Nicola Batters be snogging with Derek and Kurt. <laughs> They're well stuck in too heavyish petting. It's far too dark to see what you're getting. Tracy's bra flies off her upsetting and several people are hurt. <laughs> Be. What can that moth-eaten pile of old tatters be? It's Tracy Clegg and Nicola Batters be getting chucked up the last 92. With miles to go and no chance of hitching, and Nicola's boots are bust at the stitching. Tracy laughs and says, what's the point, bitching? I can't give a bugger, could you? in your car.
twin cam 16 valve engine, 90 to 150 brake horsepower, multi link suspension, the Nissan Primera. Okay, guys, get back to work. What kind of mortgage have you got? Meet the Millers. Don't ask him what kind of mortgage we went for. He was too uh, busy haggling to haggling, notice. As you know. We went fixed rate because the Midlands said that that would suit us better. Yeah, but haggling is a big part of the house buying process. Well, I, I, if you ask me, uh, I think there's a bit of it in everyone. Well, I didn't notice any in the Dixons. Everything you asked for, they gave you. Yeah, but that's because it's a buyer's market. We got them to leave the curtains, the carpets, and the dining room table, and, and the plant in the bathroom. And a dead fish in a coffin. It's a stuffed trout in a case. Caught in 1922 by Mr. J.P. Spooner. Slung in the dustbin 1992 by Mrs. J.A. Miller. If you think a fixed rate mortgage might suit you, meet the Midland, the listening bank. A funny thing happened to me a bit ago. I got pregnant. Now, look, I don't know how that happened. Honestly, you lose concentration for one minute. And... <laughs> I thought, well, I'd better find out if I am or not, but I didn't want to go to the doctor, because our doctor's surgery is not very private, because he's in a sort of porter cabin. And people going past on the pavement can hear symptoms through the expel air. <laughs> so I thought, well, I'll go to the chemist and buy a pregnancy testing kit and do it myself. Well, we've got two chemists where I live, a little tiny old one and a big new modern one. I thought, well, I'll go to the little tiny old one first, because it's nearer. But it's very old-fashioned. I mean, a few years ago, if you went in to try and buy a condom, they'd sell you a shower cap and a rubber band. <laughs> and I'm not sure it's much better now, because the girl who works there at the moment is a bit dim, and she's a bit dyslexic, and she's never really got latex and Jurex. You know, just sorted out in her mind. I mean, she sold one poor boy a surgical stocking. <laughs> and when he saw the size of it, he was so miserable. To... <laughs> well, he had a terrible sex life, but he never got varicose veins, I suppose. And I thought, no, they won't have one. You know, probably their idea of a pregnancy testing kit is a woman in a crossover pinny going, well, it wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> I thought, no, I'll go to our new chemist, which is very upmarket and modern, you know, it's all neon lights and prawn sandwiches. And there's hardly anything medical in it at all. You could cruise the aisles for 20 minutes where you spotted your clearer sill. Anyway, I rushed in and I grabbed the first thing I could see that looked like a pregnancy testing kit, and I took it outside and it was actually a bicycle repair outfit. <laughs> I thought, well, I'll keep it, you know, in case I am pregnant and I do have a baby and it um, gets a puncture. I don't know why I'll keep it. So I go back in and I'm feeling really embarrassed. I'm trying to look as if I'm not looking for one for myself. You know, I'm just looking on behalf of a friend of mine who has sexual intercourse on a regular basis. And anyway, there's a huge, great counter full of things that look like pregnancy testing kits. And I go a bit nearer and they're not. There's something that's called ovulation predictor kits. Now, I didn't know about these. These are kits that tell you when it's a good time to try and have a baby. They tell you when there's an egg on the way. There's one coming down now, get going. <laughs> Because it's quite crucial, this egg business, apparently, because you only get one egg a month. You know, like the war. <laughs> and this kit is for people who don't really like doing it, but they want to have a baby. Well, they don't really want a baby, but they want a buggy and a raffle, so why not? <laughs> and if they do it right with this kit, then they only have to do it the once, then. So you might think they might throw themselves into it, but they won't. Well, he might throw himself into it, but she'll just be lying there drumming her fingers on his back saying, what was the name of that woman with big earrings in Crossroads? What were it? <laughs> anyway, I obviously don't need an ovulation predictor kit, so I move along to the pregnancy testing kit. And there's hundreds of them, but they all seem to be basically the same, you know. Some of them turn pink if you're pregnant, and some of them turn blue, and some of them have a little computer printout that says, we know what you've been doing, we know what you've been doing. <laughs> and they've all got a picture on the lid of the box of a woman going like this. <laughs> And this woman is wearing a very fancy dressing gown tied around the middle, and mules. <laughs> I think, well, I'm sorry, I don't mind doing this test. I'm not wearing the mules. <laughs> no, because I don't like them. I sort of associate them with women who invite the milkman in. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and I can't wear the dressing gown, because I can't wear anything that ties around the middle, because I haven't got a waist. I mean, I've got a sort of place, you know, where my trousers meet the rest of me, but it's not, it's not really what you could call a waist. It's really more a sort of unmarked level crossing. <laughs> 
So I haven't got a dressing gown. In fact, I haven't got any fancy bedtime clothes at all. I sometimes panic, you know, that there might be a fire in the middle of the night and I'll have to be rescued by a fireman. I think I'll just have to throw him over my shoulder, I think, really. <laughs> All I've got are those huge T-shirts you get in the sales, and you think, oh, these are good, and then you wash them, and the hem's only level if you limp after that. <laughs> anyway, I pick out my pregnancy testing kit, and it's got the woman on the lid of the box going, am I up the duff or am I not? I wonder. <laughs> and you think, well, in her case, you know, she's probably not. By the time she's untied her dressing gown and taken her mules off, they probably never got around to doing it in the first place. <laughs> anyway, I put it in my basket. I throw in some contraceptive foam and a bunion pad, just to fox the assistant. <laughs> And I rush outside with it, see, because I'm desperate to have a look at it. And I have to push my way past all the people stood there admiring themselves in the security cameras. They're all going, hey, look, Janice, let's stop your head. Janice, look, what I'm pointing now, let's stop your head. No, look, what I'm pointing now, look, what I'm pointing now, no, look, no. And I rush outside and I sit down and I probably look a bit of a wreck, you know, with this old jacket on, this old carrier bag, because two people throw me money. <laughs> and a woman with a moustache and string tied around her raincoat comes up and says, go around back at Tesco's, it's stale bread day. <laughs> Well, I sit down and I unpack my pregnancy testing kit, and the first thing I take out is the diagram. Well, I'm not really good with diagrams. I remember when I first saw the one in the Lillette's packet. Put a ship in a bottle every month, it'll be quicker. <laughs> anyway, unpack the pregnancy testing kit, and what you get, you get the diagram and the instructions and a sort of little test tube thing, and you get a sort of chemical impregnated paddle. And what you have to do is wee on this paddle, right? <laughs> now, this was a new one on me, weeing on paddles. <laughs> During a paddle, I'd heard about, but not on one. And, I have to say, I feel women are not equipped for weeing on paddles. <laughs> I feel we don't have the fine-tuning, somehow. <laughs> we have the engine capacity, but not the steering, I would. I know, look at it. <laughs> no, let's not dwell on it, please. Um, anyway, I'm desperate to have a go at it, you know, to find out if I'm pregnant. So I think, well, I'll go to the nearest public lavatory, which happens to be in the multi-storey car park, which is next to the chemist. Well, I go in, and the whole lavatory is completely deserted. There's a queue of people waiting to wee in the lift, but there's nobody actually there. <laughs> I think, well, I'm not surprised it's deserted. It's absolutely covered in graffiti. I mean, I don't mind a bit of graffiti, but it's a bit depressing when people can't even spell pubic. <laughs> and there's things written up like, I love Baz, signed Holly. It's actually said singed Holly, but uh, <laughs> it's easy to lose concentration with a nail file. I love Baz, signed Holly. Oh, no, you don't, Holly, you cow. Baz belongs to me, Donna. <laughs> and then there was Baz loves Donna in a sort of heart. Well, I think it's meant to be a heart. It actually looked more like a sort of sports bra, but I think it's meant to be a heart. <laughs> I love Baz, signed Donna. I love Baz, signed Holly. I love Baz, signed Peter. He pops in from another lavatory, I don't know. <laughs> Baz is great, signed Holly McManus. Holly McManus is a big fat slag. <laughs> and nobody will touch her with a barge pole, Donna. Well, she'd actually spelt that like opinion pole, pole. But you couldn't really have Holly McManus as a big fat slag, nobody will touch her with an opinion pole. <laughs> That wouldn't make sense, would it? Anyway, the people who do opinion polls are desperate. They'll have anybody. <laughs> well, poor old Baz was all over the place. Baz is great. Baz snogs fabulous. Baz did it to me lords and lords. <laughs> I thought there'd be a little sign scratched up somewhere. Baz is knackered. Please leave him alone. <laughs> and then I thought, actually, you know, this is not the most hygienic place to do a pregnancy test. I mean, I don't know how long since these lavatories were cleaned. There's a little saucer by the wash basins with a threepenny bit and a sixpence in it. <laughs> I thought, where can I go? Where would it be nice? I thought, I know, I know. I can go to our new shopping centre and go to the department store there. It's very new, this shopping centre. In fact, it's so new, it's not called a shopping centre. It's called a Pickwick-style purchasing experience. I think it's supposed to be sort of Dickensian, you know, because it's got the Mr Bumble coffee shop and the little Nell Carburetta centre and things. So I get on a bus. I get on a bus to go out to it, because it's out of town. They do that with shopping centres now. They build them out of town so that poor people can't go in and eat their sandwiches by the fountains. <laughs> ended up in the ladies' room of the department store, and it was called the powder room, and it had that drawing on the door of the woman with the sticky-out skirt and the handbag. <laughs> and I, of course, got neither of these things. It's got a sticky-out stomach and a carrier bag, I think, but that will do. 
Well, I have to queue up, but I eventually get into a cubicle. Actually, I burst in on a woman who's forgotten to lock the door, which is a bit embarrassing, because she's standing there taking the price tags off her shoplifting. <laughs> Anyway, I go in and I sit down and I take out the instructions and there's been a sort of a misprint because like halfway down the page, half the words are in English, half the words are in French. Well, I'm no good at French because I didn't do French at school, I did woodwork. It's a bit of a shame because all my friends went to France's au pairs, I did three weeks in a deck chair factory. <laughs> so the thing is, it takes me ages to work out what I'm supposed to be doing and there's people rapping on the door, there's a woman threatening to take the door off the hinges with a Swiss Army knitting needle and I'm getting very flustered, you know. And obviously, in the end, what I've got to do is wee on my paddle. And I feel very sort of inhibited. I think everybody's listening to me. And I really, really want to do it. But I feel under such pressure, I can't do it. I think, oh, is this what it's like to be a man in bed? <laughs> you know, it sort of gives you a sort of insight into impotence, you know. I mean, all I'm really missing is the woman humping over onto her shoulder going, oh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I can't do anything, and short of obtaining counselling from the woman in the next door cubicle through the gap, I think, well, I'll just leave it for now. So I pack everything back up, you know, my chemicals, my instructions, my test tube, and I come out, and they've all heard all this clinking and rustling, and they all think I'm on drugs. <laughs> and there's a woman in a plastic rain hood about to make a citizen's arrest. Well, I managed to get away from her, all right, by putting on the hand dryer and bonding her head to the vanity unit. <laughs> I think, well, what I'll do, I'll go and find a cafe and I'll get a cup of tea and then I'll be able to do my test. So I'm walking along thinking, oh, I wonder if I am pregnant. And if you are pregnant, do you have to get special maternity knickers or anything? Which you don't, by the way. No, because if you are pregnant, spend so much time being fiddled about with, it's not worth wearing any. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that in, you know. It might be a useful piece of information for somebody. It might be somebody in our audience who's newly pregnant. <laughs> She's talking about us, Dave. <laughs> And I find a cafe, it's not the nicest cafe I've ever been in. It's got this huge man behind the counter. There's no menu, you just have to look at his vest and guess. <laughs> and I sit down, it's not too bad. There's little check curtains up at the windows, and there's a calendar with a picture of a dog with a boot in its mouth, you know. It's a rock violer, there's a man's leg in the boot. But um, <laughs> the trouble is the tea isn't very nice. It's bright orange, and I spill a bit, and it burns a hole in the formica. <laughs> I think, well, I'll have a cold drink, you know, that'd probably be more healthy. Well, I look round, he's got rows and rows of cans of Coke. Well, I haven't drunk Coke for years, you know, not since I was at youth club. It's very strong. I think if I have one now, I might start running about with a ping pong bat being that stupid. <laughs> well, the only other cold drink he's got is dandelion and burdock. I think, well, I'll have that, you know, it sounds rather healthy, doesn't it? You know, flowers and herbs and things. So I have two huge glasses of dandelion and burdock, and I go up to use his lavatory to do the test. And I go in, there's a massive great mirror with a big neon light over the top. Now, you know how unflattering a neon light is? And I'm just stood there looking at myself, and I'm thinking, you just look so old. I think you're just too old to have a baby. I think, what will I do when it's in the infants, and it's the sports day, and it's the mummy sack race? I think I'll have to lie down in mine and have it dragged by a donkey. <laughs> I'm thinking, do they do child benefit and old age pension on the one gyro? <laughs> Suppose we get short of cash, it needs a new blazer, I need hormone replacement therapy. <laughs> I think, well, maybe I should have a facelift or something, you know, it might improve matters. Lots of my friends are having things done. A friend of mine had little bits taken off here, bits taken off here, bits taken off here. But there's so many bits left over, they made her up a matching handbag in the end. <laughs> oh, and another friend of mine, she had a breast reduction. Her firm had asked her to have it done because she was their secretary and they had a wipe clean memo board and her nipples kept erasing important appointments. <laughs> These are only my very thin and neurotic body-conscious friends who are having things done. These are my friends who are always on a diet. And they're always phoning the Samaritans and saying, You've got to help me, I've just had a Toblerone. <laughs> I've got lots of other friends who don't care. I've got lots of massive, jolly friends who do lots of dangerous, life-threatening things like drinking and smoking and driving Bedford vans with no wing mirrors on them. And... <laughs> And they're great, they have exercise parties, you know. They put on an aerobics video and they open a bottle of wine and sit down and criticise the leotard. <laughs> anyway, I do the test and what it is, if it goes pale pink, you're probably pregnant. And if it goes bright pink, you're definitely pregnant. And if it goes purple, it's probably triplets and you should phone for an ambulance. <laughs> so I do it and I think it's gone pale pink, but it's a neon light, you know, it's a bit hard to tell. So I go down and I ask the man in the filthy vest. And he says he thinks it has, but two women in the corner with the custard slice and two straws think it hasn't. So this is a bit of a dilemma. I think, well, we'll call in Nelly from the back. Nelly will know. Nelly's in charge of the chip pan. She's got a city and guilds in the care and handling of Greece. <laughs> she never married. Nobody could get hold of her. Do <laughs> it. Anyway, she comes in from the back and she puts her glasses on, which are in her apron pocket between two slices of bacon. And she has a look and she says she thinks it has gone pale pink and I am pregnant. So 
I walk home, and I have to go past mother care on my way home. And I'm thinking, oh, God, I'll have to get some of these big floppy dresses with the big bow at the neck now. <laughs> now, the bow is supposed to sort of detract from your bulge somehow. I don't really quite see how. But like trying to conceal St Paul's Cathedral by putting a bobble hat on the top of it. <laughs> anyway, I go home, and I think, well, I'm pregnant now, and I do all the right things, you know, I put my feet up and eat coal and all that, but... Um, I don't feel pregnant, you know, I don't feel sick, I don't get varicose veins. I get a broken toe, but that's from dropping a mother care catalogue on my foot. <laughs> And I'm thinking, have I made a mistake? Have I done something wrong with this test? And I think, no, no, it's probably all right. Don't panic. So I knit some booties, because I can knit. I can knit on very, very big needles. Only I can't turn heels, unfortunately. So I see end up with a couple of wind socks. At, um, <laughs> I have to flog to Manchester Airport. But um, I still feel something's a bit amiss. I think, I know what to do. I'll go to the library, and I'll get out a book on pregnancy, and I'll check the symptoms, and then I'll know. So I go to the library, and they've got rows and rows of books on pregnancy and childbirth and breastfeeding. <gasps> breastfeeding looks so complicated. They've got all these photographs of little tiny weedy babies wrapped up in blankets and huge great bosoms. <laughs> it's like asking somebody in a straight jacket to eat their lunch of a beach ball. <laughs> and they got so many books on birth, you know, natural childbirth, active childbirth. <gasps> a friend of mine was very, very keen on active childbirth. She was very assertive, this woman, and she insisted on marching round and round the hospital till she felt ready, and there she lay down over a beanbag and had it by torchlight and all this. <laughs> Now, they put the lights on, she was in the TV lounge, so that's her. <laughs> anyway, I take down a book on pregnancy and I check the symptoms. Moody, irrational, big bosoms. I've been pregnant for 20 years, according to this. <laughs> but I still feel something's a bit wrong somewhere, so I think, well, I'll just check the instructions to the pregnancy test one more time. And right at the bottom, in tiny, tiny print, in English, where I haven't seen it before, it said, this test will give a false reading if you have had alcohol, drugs, or herbs. Brackets, e.g. dandelion and burdock. <laughs> Wasn't pregnant at all. The whole thing was a gigantic mistake. <gasps> was so upset. I went home, I had two bottles of wine, a deep dish pizza, we had a blazing row, we made it up, and then I was pregnant. <laughs> Tomorrow's Sunday Mirror, a thousand and one ways to improve your sex life. An intimate three-part guide to bring you and your partner closer and closer. Discover how lovemaking can be more fulfilling, more exciting for you and the person you love. Free, only with the Sunday Mirror, tomorrow. I remember her delicate fragrance floating on the air. She said the ocean was gone. You just dive straight in, clothes and all. Like some kind of free spirit. You know, she'd swear there was a garden at the bottom of the ocean. And that night, I found it. Free spirit from impulse. For those who like their tea to taste like tea, finding the word decaffeinated might be somewhat disconcerting. But when you gently decaffeinate your tea within hours of picking it, then getting a modern cup of tea to taste like a proper one... Ooh, look, silly lions. Well, it isn't hard to swallow at all. Lions decaffeinated tea. Keep the flavour, keep the taste. When you use our new direct spray washing machine, it's much more efficient because it's like having a shower as opposed to having a bath. The new direct spray washing machines 
from Electrolux. That was me, Janine Roebuck, taken only three months before I lost 24 pounds on the SlimFast plan. It was easy with SlimFast. You have a delicious, nutritious shake for breakfast, one for lunch, and a proper dinner. The weight is gone. I feel younger and healthier than ever before, thanks to SlimFast. Give SlimFast a week. See the weight come off. Now the SlimFast hot chocolate. Another delicious way to lose weight. Been looking at this terrible photograph of myself in a paper. We have taken this as a school reunion. I knew I should never have gone. I got sent this invitation saying it was 25 years since we'd all gone to this school aged 11. I thought, why should I go? I had a terrible time at school. I was always being sent out, made to stand in the corridors. I thought the only people who recognised me would be the cleaners. <laughs> well, I went and I stood there in the doorway and I could see all these women in little sensible perms and little tweedy dresses. And I thought, God, the teachers haven't changed. And those were the girls. <laughs> The first girl I saw was this girl called Jane, and I was always quite jealous of her at school because she was so good at gym and she could go hand over hand up the rope, you know. I recognised her straight away. She was having a cup of coffee at the top of the curtains. <laughs> but, but I was looking for one particular girl. You know there's always one girl you remember, and you always think, oh, I wonder what happened to them. Well, this was a girl called Beverly. Well, no, she was actually called Love Bite Beverly. <laughs> because she was forever taking me in the program and showing you her love bites, you know. And she was the sort of girl, you know, she was always, always in trouble. You'd always see her in the corridor being told off by the headmistress, and the headmistress would be saying, Beverly, you're the laziest, most conceited, trivia-obsessed girl I've ever been unlucky enough to attempt to teach. And she'd go, oh, thanks a lot, Tom. <laughs> but she never went swimming, you know, she always had a period. Well, in the end, they sent somebody around from the Guinness Book of Records about it. <laughs> I couldn't see her. I thought, well, she won't be here. You know, she'll have some exotic job now. She'll be in Antigua or on Mustique, you know, bumming fags or Princess Margaret or something. <laughs> and I couldn't see the headmistress either, fortunately. I was a bit worried about meeting her again because with these 200 lines, you know, I'd never handed in. And Because <laughs> the woman that came heading straight towards me was the woman I most did not want to see, and that was the woman who did the careers advice. We had a little room called the careers office, you know, like a little hole under the stairs with a folding chair and a pamphlet on munitions in it. <laughs> Uh, this terrible woman, I mean, actually, she was miles ahead of her time. She was putting girls into jobs with no money and no prospects years before YTS was ever thought of. <laughs> but she was horrible. <laughs> like, all these little 15-year-old girls would come and say, well, I'd really like to work outdoors, and I feel I have quite a rapport with animals. And she'd say, well, this will suit you. They need somebody at the abattoir to stun the heifers. <laughs> But it was so funny to see what all these girls had ended up with, you know, what their jobs were and everything. Like, there was one girl, oh, I really hated her at school. She was on my table for sandwich dinners. And she was really rich, this girl. You know, she had to have a thermos wide enough to take lobster. <laughs> and, and we all hated her on our table, because she used to bring a Cadbury snack as part of her lunch every day. You know, the six little biscuits in one packet. And she would never hand them around. She would always eat every one of those six little biscuits herself. And no matter how much you begged or pleaded with her, she would never give you a biscuit. Well, she was now at the DHSS on the one-off hardship payment counter. <laughs> I was just thinking about British people the other day. I was just thinking there could never be a revolution in this country. Like, if we'd had the Ceausescus, there's no way we would have taken them out and executed them. We would have written funny letters to points of view about them. <laughs> The nearest we've ever got to civil disobedience was the poll tax riot. That was hardly the October Revolution, was it? Do you remember you got about three women at the front going, but we don't think it's a very fair tax, actually. <laughs> you got about 300 other people behind them smashing in windows and carrying away the entire stock of Dorothy Perkins. And <laughs> I think the only time there would be a mass uprising in this country is if they banned car boot sales and caravanning. <laughs> I just don't understand about caravanning, do you? I don't understand these people who can only have a relaxed vacation if they're accompanied at all times by their own washing up brush. <laughs> and caravan sites, I mean, the people who go to caravan sites live in a perfectly normal environment for 50 weeks of the year. And they suddenly feel, feel obliged to sample life as it is lived in a refugee camp after an earthquake. <laughs> the lure of the open road, because half those caravans never go anywhere, do they? Only the British could have invented the stationary caravan. <laughs> it's just so 
hard in this country. We don't like to be comfortable. We like to be miserable, don't we, in this country? Like, if you give British people a nice green flowery meadow to have a picnic in, they won't. They'll drive past it for three hours on the motorway trying to get to a Julie's pantry. <laughs> It's like car boot sales. Give British people a nice car. They won't drive round in it. They'll stand next to it in a school playground in the rain, trying to flog an old roller blind and a jigsaw out of the back of it. <laughs> because we don't like to be happy in the country. We don't like it, do we? Like, if there's a heaven, which I doubt, because I think the people from hell have probably bought it for a timeshare, <laughs> but if... a heaven. You'll find people from all over the world rejoicing and singing and praising God. All the British people will be in a little huddle in a corner by the wall going, I'm sorry, it's not good enough. <laughs> Where's St Peter? It looks nothing like the brochure, does it? We're supposed to be our best in a crisis, aren't we, in this country, with our marvellous stiff upper lips and our marvellous sense of humour. Like, if you ever read a report of an accident or a disaster anywhere in the world, the British people involved are always described as laughing and joking. <laughs> Mr Smith laughed as he was winched to safety. <laughs> as she was cut free from the wreckage, Catherine had emergency workers in fits. <laughs> Why? Why? Why this compulsion to joke? I mean, I dread being in a train crash anyway, but it's going to be eight times worse if I'm going to be trapped under the luggage rack and ten bleeding amateur comedians are going to come crawling out the bubble. <laughs> so good at things like that and we're so bad at personal things aren't we like sort of love and romance and sex we're hopeless at in this country because we can't talk about things like that can we i think that's why british women have this compulsion to sleep with foreigners when they go on holiday abroad because <laughs> then they don't have to talk to them it's like it doesn't count it's like it doesn't matter what he touches as long as he can't pronounce it properly <laughs> Well, we're not doing it and we're all doing it like mad. It's just that nobody's talking about it. On it, if you read our paper, the back page, the whole of the back page is a personal column. It's all things to do with sex. There's an advert every week for a call girl. Call me Dorinda for personal service. Not Tuesday, as I'm at bingo. <laughs> There's an advert every week for a massage parlour. Now that could be genuine. I think that's put in by a man who used to run on with a sponge at Aston Villa. But, <laughs> but half of these adverts are from ordinary people who wish to get involved with wife swapping. Well, I can never really believe wife swapping actually goes on. I sort of imagine it's something invented by the tabloids and blown up out of all proportion. You know, like Samantha Fox was. But, um, <laughs> but I, can sort of, I can sort of imagine it going on in Hollywood, you know, in the Hollywood Hills, naked film stars leaping from chandeliers and ladling cocaine up out of Tupperwares. But I sort of, can't imagine an orgy going on in Bridlington, can you? <laughs> hey, now, steady on, man, my barometer. <laughs> I mean, because I mean, British people are very reserved, aren't they? I mean, physically. I mean, I know I am. I keep the strip in my bikini bottoms after I bought them. <laughs> just tell him, just tell him what it means. It's quicker. Just tell him. <laughs> I mean, I have been trying to picture an evening of British wife swapping, and it's very difficult to do. Look, I'll take two imaginary couples, right? What's I call the first couple? Janet and John, right? What should I call the other couple? Nip and Fluff? No, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> Janet and John and um, Robert and Pam, right? Robert and Pam have decided to hold an evening's wife swapping at their lovely new home at the Open Crotch 32 Willow Crescent. <laughs> They've sent out their invitations, 7 for 7.30, refreshments provided at half time. <laughs> That's when we'll change ends. So say it's about, it's about half past six, right? What's actually going on? Janet and John are getting ready to come out. She's getting her G-string out of the airing cupboard and he's frantically splashing his private parts with high karate. <laughs> in the other house, Pam's doing a last-minute hoover of the lounge and setting out those little things in bowls, olives, cashew nuts, condoms. <laughs> Ding dong, there goes the doorbell. Janet and John are on the doorstep. She's still telling off, John, John, what? Don't forget what I said about foreplay. What did you say? I said, do some. <laughs> I remember you said now, beef burgers. What? Three minutes each side. That's right. <laughs> Ding dong, there goes the doorbell again. Pam goes out, Robert, Robert, can you answer the door? And Robert, KY jelly, too ostentatious in a dish? <laughs> Robert flings open the door, there's John, Janet and John. Oh, hello, Janet, John. And we've not done an awful lot of wife stopping before. We, we didn't know whether we should bring a bottle or not. Anyway, we brought this, and these are the batteries for it. <laughs> but then what 
what they do to the organ in the lounge and have a dry sherry. Can I tempt anybody to a low-fat crinkle? I beg your pardon? It's a crisp. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought we'd started. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. I see you've had your nipples pierced, Pam. <laughs> yes, aren't they good? <laughs> 8 99 on the indoor market. <laughs> I was hoping later on perhaps your husband could rotate my sleepers for me. <laughs> Do. I mean, do they pair off? Then do they swap? Does Pam show Robert and Janet up to the spare bedroom? Oh, yes, it is quite nice, isn't it? Oh, mind the headboard. It's only MFI. It won't take a multiple orgasm. <laughs> then does she go back down and rejoin John in the lounge and they have another dry sherry? Oh, geez. I think it's so important to keep your marriage alive in this way, don't you, John? Robert and I, we tried to make love in a different part of the house each week. Yes, I think the front hall had a particular frisson, <laughs> with us having a glass front door. <laughs> No, it didn't bother me, but the Christian aid woman had to wait a few minutes for her envelope. <laughs> oh, that's marvellous what you're doing, John. That's perfect. Keep doing that. Go on, keep going, keep going, keep going. Yes, that's marvellous. That's wonderful. Go on, go on, go on. Yes. Now tune in Channel 4. <laughs> Upstairs, Janet's being a little bit tense, so Robert dims the lights and puts on some of his favourite music. Unfortunately, the Baron Knights aren't everybody's cup of tea. <laughs> so he attempts to engage Janet in conversation. Do you know the uh, Karma Sutra at all, Janet? Oh, yes, we went there for our wedding anniversary. <laughs> Oh, the book with the positions in it. Yes, I, I do know. We had it out of the library. It wasn't very satisfactory. I thought later on it might have been better if I hadn't been wearing my leotard. <laughs> but it wouldn't suit my husband, you see. These exotic things. He's not very experimental. He was 38 before he had quiche. <laughs> <laughs> Back downstairs, John's trying to do his duty. Is there anything you particularly like, Pam? No, I don't think so. Is there anything you particularly don't like? Only beetroot. <laughs> do for you, John? What about a little bit of role-playing? That's always rather fun. Are there any sort of sexy, sultry sirens I could dress up and pretend to be, like Madonna or Marilyn Monroe or... I beg your pardon? Well, I can try. I don't know if I can do all the Beverly Sisters. <laughs> oh, there's something you can do for me, John. I'm very much turned on by men in uniform. Would you mind? I've got a uniform here. Would you mind just popping it on? Yes, go on, button it up. Now try the cap. Now try it without the lollipop. It might be better. <laughs> Upstairs, Janet's being a little bit more relaxed and she's decided to give an impromptu performance of the Dance of the Seven Veils. Unfortunately, they haven't got any veils and by the time she's unbuttoned the sixth bed jacket, Robert's rather lost interest. So she attempts to revive his flagging ardour with a spot of intimate hand massage. It doesn't go terribly well. Robert's not too keen and, to be fair to Janet, the last time she did anything like that, she was unblocking a sink. <laughs> Upstairs, Pam, remembering the film Nine and a Half Weeks, thinks it might be rather nice to be licked all over. So she sends John to the kitchen for some aerosol cream. Unfortunately, it's unfamiliar cupboards and he comes back with spray oven cleaner. <laughs> and Pam loses two birthmarks and a tattoo. <laughs> Upstairs, in a last ditch attempt to get things going, Robert rips off all his clothes, tears back the bedclothes and leaps naked from the dressing table to lie spread-eagled where Janet is lying. Unfortunately, she's moved aside <laughs> to examine a copy of the Rosemary Connolly Hip and Thigh Diet. And Robert is lying face down on the bed, alone. As if this were not humiliating enough, the bottom sheet is brushed nylon. <laughs> and this hooks onto his pubic hair. And Robert is pinned to the mattress, velcroed at the crotch. <laughs> well, Janet has to call for assistance at this point, and it ends up with John holding him up while Pam cuts him loose with the bacon scissors. <laughs> well, they all go back down to the lounge after this mishap, and they sit around rather miserably with a cup of decaf. And uh, things have gone a bit flat at this point, so Robert suggests they all spice things up by looking at one of his soft porn magazines. And Pam says, no, sorry, that would make her feel inadequate. So Janet suggests they all read a DIY magazine. And Robert says, no, that would make him feel inadequate. <laughs> well, she's just thinking about leaving, and Robert has one last try. He goes away, he comes back, and he's slipped into a pair of see-through plastic underpants. <laughs> Janet says, oh, that reminds her, turkeys are 20p off at B-Jam. <laughs> Oh, 
Well, she's just on the doorstep, ready to leave, and Robert has one last go. He gets very, very romantic, and he starts to kiss her on the back of the neck. <laughs> That's very nice. I've never had the back of a neck kiss before. <laughs> it's rather romantic. Yes, you can kiss my hand if you want to. Yes, go on. Go on, kiss the other one. Yeah. Yes, you can kiss my bare feet if you want to, honey. Man, my left foot, because I've got a veruca. <laughs> it's just about to come off. Has it come off? <laughs> no, spit it out, it won't look. <laughs> oh, what a marvellous sensation. Well, you won't be able to top that. We may as well go home. Good evening. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to finish now with a little song. And I'd just like to say thank you very much for coming and being such a nice audience, because you have been. And I'd just like to say thank you very much for coming out. And well, you could have stayed in, couldn't you? You could have. You could have had a lovely, cozy domestic evening at home with your bird's eye menu master. The bird of freedom. Just five minutes after you've had it, you're going, what can we do now? <laughs> well, you could have stayed in and got a video out, couldn't you? When Harry Met Sally. That's supposed to be very good. I haven't seen that yet. That hasn't hit our village video shop yet. That will be a bit racy for where we live. We mainly have sort of TV and sport videos, you know, like Emma Dale, the Matt and Dolly years. <laughs> Bobby Charlton presents a decade of the goalless draw. That sort of a video. Oh, we had Rain Man. Rain Man was very popular. I think because compared with the people where I live, Dustin Hoffman was very vivacious and outgoing in that. <laughs> Good, isn't it, when Harry met Sally? Hasn't it got something about faking an orgasm in it or something? In a restaurant. People do get steamed up about orgasms, don't they? I was once in bed with somebody, and this man said to me, and he turned to me, looking very worried, and he said, now tell me the truth, have you ever faked an orgasm? I said, oh, come on, I've never even made a marzipan snowball. <laughs> I'm going, to, I'm going to finish with this song, and I'm going to do something I don't normally do. I'm, I'm going to dedicate it to, uh, to a lady in the audience. Um, I don't usually do this, but um, she sent me a nice note around backstage before the show, and uh, I'm afraid I've forgotten her name. She's sitting in the... God, what's it called? The, um, the, bal the circle. And um, she said that... She said she got her tickets a long time ago, and she was supposed to be coming tonight with her husband, but he's not here, because he's in hospital. Um, he's in Stoke Mandeville Hospital, and she said, would I just say on her behalf how marvellous the staff are at, at Stoke Mandeville, and how they're really helping him, and the teaching him to do things like, um, you know, drive a car and get dressed and cook and things like that. He's not paralysed, he's just a pillock. <laughs> Not enough. I would like to live more times than this. If you don't agree, then tough. Tee you up. <laughs> there are other lives going on I haven't lived, and this gives me a sense of frustration. Frustration. I'm not bothered about being Mary Queen of Scots or Joan of Arc. I just fancy 20th century reincarnation. To keep coming back and trying a different track. I'd like to go round and round, cause I never feel I've got this right. It isn't a proper scheme, I just wanna let off steam. We all have to have a dream, and I'm following my dream tonight. I want to be Mrs. Pew and live in an avenue. I want to have bing bong chimes in a bathroom with a champagne suite. My candlewick dressing gown. I want to put harpic down. If my ironing smells quite fresh, then my happiness will be complete. I'll wear an apron when I chop my veggies. Have tiny cactus on my window ledges. Have a roller blind with scalloped edges. I will never use a wok so. I prefer to stick to Mrs. Beaton, have a hob which I can then reheat on, use my toaster with the ears of wheat on. <laughs> I will do a lot with Oxo. I want to be Martin Jones, a salesman for mobile phones. I want to shake hands a lot, sit in wine bars while I make my sales. I want to drink warm rosé, keep saying no way, Jose. Live in a Docklands flat with a mortgage that's the size of Wales. 
I'll keep my bottle when the market's crashing. Be super cool when profits take a bashing. I'll cross the crossing when the green man's flashing. I'm a devil on a zebra. I'll meet a girl and feel a good vibration. Give her flowers for a nice flirtation. Three carnations from a petrol station. Take her for an aqua libra. To be Pauline Park and work as an invoice clerk. I want to eat lean cuisine, even though I'm eight stone three. I'll sit and I'll fantasize about cruel men with piercing eyes. Then I'll microwave two mince pies and have them with a cup of tea. I'll watch a thriller if it's not too gory, a miniseries if I like the story. I think there ought to be more animal scoring. <laughs> no, I. Never have the news on. Dr. Scholl will be my favorite sandal. Higher heels than that I cannot handle. So Barry Manilow and held my candle. Wax was running down my blues on. I want to be Vera Page, a dame of a certain age. I want to have big red lips and a cleavage that could drown a mouse. I want to call all men swine, have visible panty line, have sing songs on British wine, I always have it in the house. I'll be known in all the pubs and chip shops, dangly jewelry and sequin zip tops, <laughs> tracksuit bottoms and stiletto flip flops. <laughs> I'll be really in the groove, eh? Never take a bus if I can cab it. Offer me a bit of life, I'll grab it. My libido would defeat a rabbit. <laughs> and I'll never change the duvet. I want to be Eileen Gum, who calls herself just a mum. I want to have three big lads and a husband that I've driven nuts. I'll struggle and sacrifice to make sure they have things nice. I'll give them such good advice, they'll absolutely hate my guts. I'll make a bag for them to take their pumps in. I'll make pyjamas they can have their mumps in. My mashed potato will have big grey lumps in. I'll control each family member. I'll make them gather round the Christmas table and eat until to move they are unable. They'll wish that Joseph never found that stable. <laughs> I'll put my sprouts on in November. I think it's a giant con. We can't all be everyone. I want to go round and round, just living every life in sight. It isn't a proper scheme. I just had to let off steam. We all have to have a dream, and I've been following my dream. Following my dream, following my dream tonight. I'm looking for my friend. <laughs> Have you seen her? <laughs> Kimberly. <laughs> She's really, really tall and really, really wide. <laughs> if she had a suitcase on the head, she'd look like a fitted wardrobe. <laughs> I'm meeting her here for a drink. We're both celebrating. 
Kimball has reached target weight at Weight Watchers. <laughs> and I've come on the right bus. <laughs> she's done real, real well at Weight Watchers, Kimberly. She's told me she's lost the equivalent of three bags of anthracite. <laughs> I said, it doesn't matter, you've got storage heaters. <laughs> she does this thing called Weight Watchers Quick Start. Says it's really, really effective because it's so quick. You run in, they shout, you're too fat, and you run out again. <laughs> We're only having one drink, because I've got to go to my evening class. I'm learning a language. It's called Get By in Flemish. <laughs> I'm learning it, you know, in case I ever go to Flem. <laughs> so I don't know what I'm having to drink. I think I might have a penis colado. Have you ever had one? <laughs> nice. <laughs> I made one myself once out of a recipe in the watchtower. <laughs> it was Ribena, pineapple chunks and evaporated milk. <laughs> I know what Kimberly will be having. Malibu. <laughs> so Malibu maniac is Kimberly. She's awful. One Malibu starts leaping about doing an Ajinsky impression. <laughs> Not the ballet dancer, the horse. <laughs> Two Malibus, you have to follow around with a shovel. <laughs> Next Saturday at 9.25, there's a special tribute to the late Frankie Howard. Entertainment for Sunday at 7.15 with Nicholas Lindhurst. Do we have any pictures of the aircraft? Uh, yes, just one. <laughs> the Piglet Files. Perfect in every detail. And at 7.45... Freddy. It's quite an area for psychic activity. Can you feel something? Hmm. Definitely. Drama with Forever Green, followed by dramatic measures in Jeeves and Worcester. Florence. Don't. The stars? 